Hello, hello. Eddie and Ben here, and I want to take a few minutes before I get started with the regularly scheduled episode to wish you all a happy new year. If you can't tell, it has been a lazy week and a half, but I hope you are taking the time to enjoy relaxing and maybe bundling up against this severe cold weather, but also just taking a day or two to rekindle our own inner fires and to make sure that we are focusing our mental health and relaxing when we need to and taking that time off to just honestly at times do nothing. This is a great chance to undo a lot of the stresses that build up over the year and hopefully we spent it with family. If not, we spent it by ourselves or we just on at least one day slept in and just enjoyed the season and celebrated everything that we accomplished in 2022. Now, in my upcoming episode, I'm going to be on a very positive note in terms of the indie books that I read this past year, 2022, which is, it's now 2023, but whatever. Anyways, I'm going to try and showcase the wonderful, wonderful books that I read back in, starting in the summer at least. And one other announcement before I get into that full episode is... That next Monday night at 7 p.m. Eastern Time, I will be doing a live episode. I'll be going through my goals for 2023 and explaining some of the changes that I have planned for this channel. I'm still going to be here. I'm still going to be putting out episodes each week. But I'm really excited and I want to take the time to write more. So there will be some changes with this channel. Anyways, I hope to see you there next Monday night at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. And with that, enjoy some fantastic books I read last year. And if you haven't read them yet, you might want to start off your new year on a high note by checking them out. Hello, hello, I'm Ben Pick, and thank you for joining me in Running to Write, where I give questionable writing advice through writing metaphors. Today, I'm doing something a little different. Recently to when I'm filming this, but it'll be a few months back for you all, author J.C. Carpenter posted a video entitled Fighting the Stigma of Self-Publishing. J.C. Carpenter posted a reaction to a different author tuber's video denouncing self-publishing. Ignoring the clickbait nature of that original video and the fact it has been since taken down, which implies a misstep, there is still a stigma surrounding self-publishing. I'm not here to do my own reaction video or share my comments on the subject, though if you stick around to the end, I will be providing my opinions because of course I have them. Instead, my intention is to raise up other indie authors whose works I've read. This summer and fall, my TBR was filled with self-published stories, so I'll be reviewing them here. I will say that I know these authors either through the AuthorTube community or as people I met at conferences, so there is a slight bias. If you think that means I'll be pulling my punches or not accurately critiquing the stories I've read, then you do not know me. I have no problem telling someone to their face the issues I observe. To put that last comment into running perspective, I will willingly go into a crosswalk when I see an obvious bad driver approaching who is about to violate traffic laws by running a red light or ignoring a stop sign. In my own way and at great risk to my body, I willingly show someone that they are in the wrong and doing something illegal. My personal safety aside, here are my thoughts on six self-published stories I read this summer and fall. Most of which I think you'll enjoy, but some of them I think you can pass on if they aren't in your desired reading genre. That being said, most of these stories are outside the typical genres I read and I have fun with all of them. Also, these stories are in the order I read them and not in any preferred ranking. Number one, Tracker by Bethany Votaw. I'm starting off strong with a five-star read and a perfect example of an outstanding self-published novel. Bethany Votaw created a vivid masterpiece where she displayed deep research on a variety of topics, including wilderness survival under dire conditions and the sheer joy of flying a helicopter. Tracker is the dramatic story of a police officer and an expert tracker as they hunt a drug dealer following a bust gone badly. The emotional moments hit hard, and the less I say about this story, the more you'll enjoy it. 
Bethany's writing made me feel like I was stranded in the cold wilderness about to lose my toes to frostbite. Side note, shout outs to Books by Adrian, which is an author tuber focused book club. Tracker was one of the books I read thanks to that group, and there will be plenty more books from that book club the next time I do the series. One last thing to note about Tracker is that it does get violent, which can be triggering for some readers. Still, I cannot recommend this gut punching story enough. Number 2 Ancient Illumination by Rod Van Blake. This novel was a well written first entry into a large space epic series chronicling a war spanning our solar system. Rod Van Blake created a topical story in which he extrapolated current societal issues into the far future. The story follows a group of enhanced mutated humans who are used as the lower class physical workforce. Some of these oppressed people have a rock-like skin, others have green skin and different physical attributes, and there are plenty of other variations for these extensions of future humanity. When enough becomes enough, they revolt against those who use them to harvest resources from dangerous moons and planets. These mutated people are seen as less than human by many. Aside from the racism allegories, there's also specific plot points about tailoring broadcasts by the media to either garner support for or against the war. There were one or two moments where the characters felt like they were spinning a story explicitly to create fake news. Rod Van Blake flexes his military knowledge to bring a sense of realism to the interplanetary conflict. Based on Rod Van Blake's writing style, I'm curious to go beyond his science fiction space opera into the fantasy series he's written. Furthermore, that fantasy series is being developed into graphic novels. Number 3, Fractals by D.L. Tillery. Fractals is D.L. Tillery's short story about a camping trip gone wrong. The main character, Delore, is excited to spend the weekend alone with her boyfriend. They've been dating for a while, and she's hoping he'll propose. Except after a freezing night, Delore is the only one to be found. Now she tries to work backwards to figure out what happened. D.L. Tillery showed off her storytelling skills in this spooky tale. She certainly earned her name, The Mistress of Horror. The pace and length of the story felt like it was built to be read in a single sitting, which I did because I couldn't put this book down until it reached its chilling conclusion. D.L. Tillery tells us just enough to paint the setting and guess emotionally invested, without becoming overly indulgent with purple prose. As the weather cools down, Fractals may be a perfect read for a Sunday afternoon curled up on the couch under a blanket and in front of the fire. Number 4, The Unlife of Lisa Cooper by J.M. Chaley. If you thought I would only be reviewing quote unquote real books, by that I mean those with paperback copies, then I have a fun surprise for you. J.M. Chaley is coming out with weekly Bella stories about Lisa Cooper, a vampire fighting against her murderous urges. The story mixes humor and horror in ways which remind me of my favorite urban fantasies. There is a lush variety of supernatural creatures all giving Lisa trouble. Plus there's a giant magical dog and who doesn't like giant magical dogs? J.M. Chaley demonstrates a deep understanding of supernatural elements which he uses in unusual ways. I've never thought about how a vampire in bat form would enter their own locked house through a maze of vents. Yet J.M. Chaley may be interested in Lisa sneaking through those vents to avoid her light traps that were intended to kill invaders. The story's plot revolves around vampire drama and various power plays, all while Lisa struggles to maintain her humanity by not giving in to her bloodlust. There is a true sense of cost each time she uses her powers. As I'm recording this, the second arc is coming to a close. Bella Books needs some love too, and this was a fun series to read. Number 5. Armored Warrior Panzerter, The Red World War by T.E. Butcher. Armored Warrior Panzerter was my second science fiction war story that I read this summer. The conflict takes place on Mars as a Russian based colony invades another over limited resources. The story bounces back and forth between various points of view on both sides of the war. If you thought those point of view characters had plot armor like I did, well, I was wrong. Admittedly, this is one of the indie books that could have used another round of editing. There were many fight scenes in which the actions and goals were unclear. Characters were referred to by any combination of first name, last name, call sign, and rank. Switching between those mid-battle, especially when some of those call signs were eliminated, was difficult to follow. The best comparison I can make is with Ichira Oda for One Piece. Sure, the battles are incredibly large and often chaotic, but at the start of each manga chapter he includes a map showing who is fighting whom and where. That mechanism gives me a point of reference so that I can see what happens when fights overlap, or when a building collapses, or so I can know the importance of what I'm reading. Back to Armor Panzer's fight scenes, there were plenty of times where characters would call out seemingly random pieces of the setting to say what they're doing. 
when character A claims they're marching up Hill 5, I don't have any context for what it means if they actually get there or why they want to go there. Or what happens if they fail. I found the story's greatest asset and detriment to be the same thing, namely that it used multiple points of view on both sides of the war. That made it so I never knew who to root for. I did appreciate how showing both sides in the war made it seem like neither one should be cheered for. Given one colony invading another, it seemed like the story primed us to be rooting against them. Except the worst atrocities in the war were accidents, and the various points of view showed how human both sides were. Although this book was published in 2019, it did a surprisingly good job of predicting the current conflicts. For those interested in the space war genre and giant robots punching each other, this could be a good read. It's also likely going to trigger a lot of readers given recent events. I had a lot of other thoughts about Armored Warrior Panzer, but I cut them due to the current conflict going on. And lastly, number six, South by Anne Malloy. South is an LGBTQ plus coming of age heartfelt romance story about a group of people attending an art college in Toronto. The hardships they face and the challenges they were forced to overcome were at times difficult to read. Mina wrote in a way which made each character feel natural as they stood out and were memorable long after I put the book down. There were some extreme cases of homophobia which I like to think were fictionalized and don't happen in real life, but unfortunately, I know better. It's not all harsh reality. There were plenty of conversations which were uplifting and felt genuine, as well as plenty of others that were outright fun. Some of those conversations even reminded me of late night talks I've had with my friends. Mina built to a satisfying conclusion which left me hopeful for the characters beyond the story. There are some trigger warnings as one of the main point of view characters suffers from extreme PTSD. There were also some romantic scenes though they were never too graphic. And contrary to my usual complaint, they didn't detract from the story here. Fun fact, having visited Toronto throughout my life, the setting felt authentic and similar to my own experiences. Those are six stories by indie authors which are more than worth checking out. Going back to my thoughts on traditional versus indie publishing, here are my quick opinions as I close out this episode. I do want to state that these are my opinions based on what I've read or observed and may be different from your own experiences. I do agree that a traditionally published book can be more vetted and edited than a self-published book. Traditionally published books have an agent decide to pick up the book where they take it back to their publishing house for approval and likely go through an in-house editor to further improve it after it's gone through one if not multiple editors to get it to that point and so on. That leads to a lot of eyes reviewing the story so it makes sense that there will be fewer grammatical errors or plot holes. Okay. That many people producing the story could cause it to lose the original author's voice. I've read plenty of traditionally published stories which felt like they only included certain details for mass market appeal. On the other hand, an indie author with similar interests to me could write a story which feels custom tailored to me as the audience. I'm not saying that one method is better or more enjoyable than the other, as there are fantastic and terrible stories in both traditional and indie publishing. My goal is to reduce the stigma that indie published books are inherently flawed and inferior. One last thing. D.L. Tillery knows the Mistress of Horror, J.M. Chaley, Bethany Votal, and A.M. Malloy are all on AuthorTube. Be sure to check out their videos and appreciate the unique voices they share with the world. Also, Rob Van Blake has a free weekly podcast on his website filled with great storytelling content. I've included links for everyone's podcasts and videos in the description below. I am Ben Pick, and thank you for joining me in Running to Write. If you enjoy my brief opinions about the indie books I've read, please press those like and subscribe buttons. Better yet, go ahead and read those indie books if you haven't already. Let me know in the comments what indie books you're reading. I have a long TBR list, but I always find a way to add in more self-published stories. I post my running and writing progress on Instagram and Twitter as Running to Write. So be sure to follow me and join in with your own thoughts. Don't forget to sign up for the Running to Write monthly newsletter if you want regular updates on my story musings, pitfalls, and lessons learned. The link is in the description below. See you next time. Until then, read a book by an indie author.